Good morning. No, I just want, want people to know that the announcements are on the screen in case you didn't know. So while we're waiting and before we get started, you can notice the announcements. Today's missionary update is uh, in regards to JD and Kim Crowley, who are just here, and uh, they're still in America, so they're not, they've not gone back yet. They're in Greenville, South Carolina. After spending uh, 10 days here in Hawaii, they went back to South Carolina to spend time with family and renew their energies and get ready to go back into the mission field at the end of the month. So um, they had a relaxing visit, apparently, and they had the opportunity to visit with and renew old friendships. And um, they were also blessed, and they also blessed other people that they have uh, come in contact with. We've known the Crowleys for 34 years. Uh, when we first moved here to the Big Island, we were attending uh, the church that J.D. was pastoring. And just as a side note, um, because the update's not a whole long session this morning, but uh, when we first moved here, um, we attended KVC for a little while, and then I had a chat with J.D. and said, Hey, J.D., I think we're going to move on to a different church. And he asked me why, and I said, Well, you know, coming from a very conservative church on Oahu, uh, it was difficult for us to, for me, to go to a church where you had people from all different backgrounds. So believe it or not, we had remnants of the hippie movement from Pahoa. We had Hare Krishnas. We had people from all different backgrounds. We had people who wore slippers in church, slippers to church, shorts to church, had wild hairstyles and bushy beards, and, and not, that, not that I'm against that, but it's just something that we were not used to. And so he stopped me right there and said, stop. Two questions. Why are you here? Second question. What do you think God is trying to teach you as a result of your being here? I couldn't answer the question. But, let me put it this way, we stayed with KBC and learned a great deal about people, about what God wanted us to do as a result of being obedient to his will. So, getting back to J.D. and Kim, um, the Rata Kaniti church pastor school which so uh, we've been praying for for months and for years frankly uh, finally had the chance to have their first session after covid stoppages after political unrest stoppages and april 8 to 11 was their first session and they had over 100 people in attendance and uh, uh, apparently um the churches there are not real clear on their doctrine and their position as far as salvation is concerned. And so what, uh, what the sessions were, they were planning to cover the first eight chapters of the Book of Romans um, because uh, the growth of the Christian movement there has been uh, a result of people other than those who are knowing that their sins have separated them from the Creator God and that re reconciliation can only be done through Christ Jesus. So the, the stage was set. And the, the, the first eight chapters were going to cover a lot of that and resolve a lot of those issues. Well, apparently um, the session went, went so well that... Um, they stopped it at the first five chapters. And testimonies and comments from people in attendance were, this is just great. 
five chapters is a lot of material to cover in four days. And uh, we felt that by taking it slower, uh, the, the, and I quote, they said, um, the gospel teachings became clearer and more dearer to them. It had, it had more meaning. Uh, it had more impact in their desire to go back and minister to their people. So after four days, uh, the session ended and uh, with covering only four, four chapters. And so we can continue to pray for that. And finally, JD just got word that they got a $22,000 donation from Frontline Ministries to, um, to print, to translate and print the commentary that he wrote on 1 John, which is already done uh, in uh, the Tempuan language, uh, in Burmese and Vietnamese to be distributed throughout Southeast Asia as well. So that's the update for the Crowleys, and uh, um, let's continue to pray. There is a, and if you look at the, the EMU newsletter, there is a testimony of one of the local pastors who passed away uh, about his testimony. Believe it or not, he was 30 years old, and uh, he was one of the, the uh, pillars of faith uh, in, in Banlung. And so if you look, uh, look on their website, there's a good story and good testimony from, from this pastor about the growth in, in the church in the area. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you that uh, J.D. and Kim were able to uh, come and visit us and share. And um, Lord, we, we just praise you that their expenses were, were met, that uh, their needs are met, and that uh, as they go back to finish their vacation uh, and their stay with their family in South Carolina, uh, that you'd continue to undertake for them, um, re-energize them as they get ready to head back into Cambodia and to continue the work there in Southeast Asia and Cambodia. So, Lord, we, we pray you give them safety as they travel, uh, that you see that all their uh, red tape uh, issues are covered and resolved. And, Lord, we know that uh, your work will continue to grow throughout the region. Um, we do pray for the people that were in attendance at the uh, pastor's school. And Lord, we trust that as they uh, were excited and energized as a result of the teachings, uh, that they would go back to their own churches and be on fire for the corrected teachings, uh, for the reinforced teachings that they received uh, at the training school and that uh, your word would continue to spread throughout Cambodia. And Lord, we just praise you for the, the financial donation of the uh, frontline mission people to, in regards to JD's testimony, I mean, in regards to JD's commentary uh, about the cults in invading Southeast Asia. And we pray that uh, you'd undertake for distribution uh, for, that, for that work. So, Lord, we thank you again for the Crowley and their the Crowleys and their mission work in Cambodia, and Lord, we commit them to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, um, we're going to have communion the COVID style way today. Uh, just a reminder: we are going to start passing the plates again. We ordered more plates because the last time we passed them with the double stack cups. I know some of you had some spillage problems, okay? And so um, that's okay. What we did is we ordered more juice cups so we could pass, pass the bread in cups and then pass the juice in cups. Unfortunately, I don't want to say which shipper, but somewhere along the lines they, have, they got lost and delayed, and they will eventually show up, but uh, it's just not when we need them. So with that in mind, I invite you to come up and get your communion materials. Remember, they are double-stacked. We'll have communion service in just a minute, uh, but feel free right now. Just come on up and get your materials while we say a couple other things. I trust that you have watched the announcements that we're playing. I'm not going to say anything else. I trust you watch the announcements or read your bulletin. Um, 
you know, we talk about prayer sheets are in the back, everything that is important. If you were not up there, if you have a ministry that I missed, and I can think of a couple things I missed. I missed the Korean church uh, ministry. That's not up there. But if you can think of something else I missed, please let me know. If you have information up there you'd like, please let me know. I'll tell you this, a few of your ministries, I had a very hard time putting a slide together. OCC was the hardest. Um, but, well, it, it was the hardest because I couldn't find artwork easily. Uh, VBS was another hard one. Um, you know, and so youth is another hard one. If you have a ministry and if you either want information up there or you design your own slide, come see me privately. I'll do whatever I can to help you with that up there, okay? Um, and then their Korean church will probably start next week, but their agreement is for today. And so that means that we need to, you know, make our plans accordingly to leave in a timely manner. And so service should not be an issue, but just a reminder about that. With that, Brother Al has youth announcements. Speaking of beard and slippers, I have your youth announcements for today. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Uncle Bobby. <laughs> All right, so tonight, 445, um, upstairs, lesson three, we're going to be going over. Um, do we have slides, Andrew? We have some slides from the youth retreat from this week, which was amazing, by the way. We had 25 people between kids and adults, um, which is not easy to pack for 25 people. Um, Jerry actually painted his, his little goatee a little while later. I started calling him the colonel. But... Um, we had an awesome time learning about um, John 14, 6. And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that was our theme for the week. The week one way. That was the only way, it's the only way we can get to God is through Jesus and his blood. And that's what we went through this week. And they tie-dyed shirts. We, we went on a hike and got lost. Amen. Amen. I think almost everybody fell. No, you didn't fall? I, I didn't fall. I slipped. But um, almost everybody fell. Um, and then while we were doing that hike, we, we had the kids um, previously before that right on the back of the rocks, the Romans Road. And we left them throughout the path. And they were painted so that you could see them. And the verses were written on the back. So we had the, the, the kids that did, uh, every, all, every kid did at least one. Some of them had two, but... When they went through those, they left them along the path at certain points. So hopefully if a hiker goes out and sees those, they're like, oh, yeah, look at that, and they'll flip it over and actually see God's word. So, And it was, like I said, an amazing experience for the kids. I want to thank those that provided food. Um, somebody actually even brought up food. Um, and then, yeah, it was, it was an awesome time. Thank you for the blessing of that. Um, I want to thank you guys for those donations that were made that made it possible for us to go, um, and it was not wasted. So I want to thank you guys for that. Um, I do have a couple of other announcements I need to make. Um, Andrew and Angela are going to be stepping away from the uh, youth ministry for a while with babies and life. Um, it's going to get kind of hectic. Andrew's going to help when he can. Um, I just want to thank them for their service and what they've done for the church and for the children of the church. Um, but they're going to be stepping away. And I'll, that being said, if you are a couple and you're interested in serving, please come see me, see my wife, see one of the deacons, see Pastor, see, what, see Auntie Brett. Um, please get involved. If you love the Lord and you love kids, especially the older, difficult ones, come see us, okay? I promise you, it's a lot of fun, all right? And then Josh or Andrew, I think you got a video. Um, just a video for you guys. Just want to say thank you to you guys for um, all your dedication to the youth group here at the church. Three, go. Thank you. That's all I got. So, thank you. Awesome, Al. And uh, was a wonderful group. Good time. Uh, I got to preach to them Friday uh, evening, right after dinner, and. and I will tell you, I, I gave him the gospel with both barrels, and so uh, I shared a little bit about that in Sunday school, and uh, there was a couple of people, at least one that I know is not saved, a couple that I'm concerned about, and uh, the person has been more and more open to the gospel. I've already reached out to the parents behind the scenes, and you know, 
some plant, some water, some harvest. And, you know, you can't rush the crop, but what we can do is we can be faithful in preaching the word. Amen? And so that's, you know, the, the younger they come to the Lord, the longer they have to serve him. And some of you may have come to the Lord later in life, but, you know, no one ever regrets living for the Lord. That was really the ultimate payoff of my message about getting saved. You're never going to get to the Lord and say, you know, I did too much for you. You know, you're going to always, the number one regret I hear on people's deathbeds is I wish I would have lived for the Lord sooner. I wish I'd have been a better husband, wish I'd have been a better father, a better mother, a better wife. I wish I would have lived for God more. That is the number one thing I hear when I deal with people who are dying. And then, of course, what I have to do as pastor is comfort them and show them that, you know, under, with Christ, it's all forgiven, and you're going to see him in a minute. But, you know, there's a lesson there to teach our young people, isn't there? To live for God now. Because what does the culture and the world say? Live it up. You only live once. And that was really the subject of, of my message to them. But anyway, communion this morning. I just want to say, some of you might be out there and not officially a member of our church yet. And we practice what I call close communion, okay, or depending on the word that you use. But the bottom line is if you're a believer in Jesus and in Christ alone, if you know that you know that you're going to heaven when you die because of what Christ did on the cross and not because of what you're doing, if you trusted in Christ and Christ alone, I welcome you to participate in this as a believer. Uh, I want to challenge you that this is something sacred, I want to challenge you that this is only for believers, and I want to challenge you that as you do this today, that you have a clean conscience, a clear account with the Lord. This is to be a time of revival in the church. If you look at our communion table, it says, this do in remembrance of me, me is Christ. We are to remember what Christ did for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For I received the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. I want to challenge you that this symbolizes... This is a picture of what Christ did on the cross. Christ died in our place. It took something perfect and precious to redeem our sins. That's how messed up we are. We need to remember the extravagance of God's love for us. And we don't do things to earn God's love. We don't do things to keep God's love. We are to live a life of worship in response to God's love. And as we stop and consider this today, the, the bread obviously represents, symbolizes his body. The juice symbolizes, reminds us the blood that was shed. It said that in the early church, one of the, the symbols for the faith was actually blood. It's one of the most recurring themes in the early church year, hundreds of years ago. And we're to remember what Christ did for us. And so I can't tell you what age your children should do this so long as they understand the importance of it. And parents, I'll leave that up to your discretion. But I just want to encourage you to take a few moments and let us consider and ask God, search me and see if there be any wicked way in me. We don't have to have revival services. Communion was designed to be revival. And let us stop and ponder that just for a minute before we pray over the elements. Lord, as we bow before you today over these elements, Lord, our sins are too many to number. So we've studied recently on Wednesday nights, 
our sins number in the millions upon millions for us individually in our lifetime and truthfully perhaps even more. You knew them all and willingly took our place on the cross and paid for us to have forgiveness. And you're so patient with us, Lord, when we sin and go astray from you, when we make little of it, when we go our own way, we resist you, fight you, and argue with you. Yet, Lord, we ask that you guide us and instruct us. To you be glory and honor and praise. Like the psalmist, we wonder what is man that thou art mindful of him. And Lord, as we partake of these elements, these things that represent what your Son did in our place, may we always be instructed and stirred. The gospel is good for the church, Lord. Help us to be renewed in our love for you. May you be glorified now and forever always in this church and everywhere we pray. Amen. We're instructed that this represents Christ's body broken for us. Eat in remembrance of him. After the same manner also he took the cup. It says drink in remembrance of Christ. not here. Now the deacons will be coming through to collect the cups or the, uh, if you'll pass them to the center aisle. I want to thank the service committee who puts these things together for us. They come so early on these Sundays and I have done that type of work when I was an assistant and I can tell you it's not easy. It's very tedious and just thank you all for the service you all do. Many of you do it behind the scenes filling in or have done it. And just thank you for the service you do and if you are able to I encourage you to find a committee to get plugged in in this church, service, social, missions. There are plenty of ministry opportunities. It doesn't have to be in front. Just serve the Lord with what you can. But thank you all. Thank you for being part of this. God bless you. Good morning, and uh, good to be here today, and it was good to to remember the Lord this way and, uh, you know, have this feast to him. It's a love feast to him. Um, and uh, we're told in um, First and Second Corinthians that if we're to glory, we're supposed to glory in the Lord, you know. And uh, it all starts at the cross, the foot of the cross, where that uh, we realize our loss, uh, in lost state in sin and we trust Christ as our Savior and Lord, let's stand and we'll sing uh, this song, Glory to His Name, number 230. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of blind. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of mine, glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in, glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of mine, glory to his name. O oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. 
There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was a blood of wine. Glory to his name. And we're going to say the second song is uh, number 246, Calvary Covers It All. I love this, oh, the words, and it's far deeper than all that the world can impart was a message that came to my heart, how that Jesus alone for my sin did atone, and Calvary covers it all, and that the course is beautiful. Calvary covers it all, that my past with its sin and stain, you know, uh, the Lord forgives, you know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there, and Calvary covers it all. Let's sing this to the Lord. Far dearer than all that the world can impart was a blessing that came to my heart. How that Jesus alone for my sin did atone and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with its sin and stain, my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there. And Calvary covers it all. The stripes that he bore and the thorns that he wore told his mercy and love evermore. And my heart bowed in shame, I called on his name, and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. with a sin and stain. My guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there, and Calvary covers it all. How matchless the grace when I look on the face of this Jesus, my crucified Lord. My redemption complete, I then found at his feet, and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with its sin and stain, my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there. And Calvary covers it all. Thank you. Have a seat, please. And thank you, Pastor. Sure. Children's Church, you are dismissed. As I see the little ones scurrying. Matthew chapter 22 this morning. Matthew chapter 22, struggled with local phrases to try to come up with a phrase that would explain what we see here. I asked Auntie Karen for her insight. We'll see if we found one. I hope so. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 15, says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, 
What thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. He saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They saith unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Let's open a word of prayer. Lord, as we bow before you today, help us to understand this passage in ways that perhaps we have never pondered. Lord, a very familiar passage to our ears. Yet some of these things, when we stop and ponder it and study it, the more we study it, the more in awe we are of your knowledge, your omniscience, your all-in-allness, Lord. We are just astonished. Lord, may we learn some incredible lessons in this passage. May you be glorified. And may we leave here changed. We ask all these things because of your son's blood shed for us, we pray. Amen. The city of Pergamum, the ancient city, was a capital in Asia, and it was the administrative home of a Roman governor. Roman governors were divided into two levels of authority, or categories, if you will. There was the, the, the governor who had the right of the sword and those who didn't. And if you wonder what the right of the sword is, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. The right of the sword is literally the ability to enforce capital punishment at their own discretion. With just a word, they could have you killed. That is power. John Stott describes what happened here. In this scenario, the, the proconsul, the governor, had his, in his office in Pergamum had the right of the sword, and at any moment he could use it against the church and apparently it was used against an early believer, an early church father named Antipas. John Stott described the probable scene this way. It is not hard to reconstruct the scene which probably saw the death of Antipas, known to be a Christian. He was summoned before the proconsul of the province. The civil leader was also the chief priest. A bust of the emperor was set on a board, a plinth, and, and a sacred fire was burned before it. To sacrifice to this in Rome and the divine emperor was a simple matter. All he had to do was sprinkle a few grains of incense on the fire and say, Curias Caesar, which means Caesar is Lord. Then he would be released. But how could he deny Christ's name and faith? Had he not at his baptism been proud and publicly affirmed his faith? Had he not at his baptism proudly and gloriously said in his faith, Curios Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Had he not been instructed that God had exalted Jesus to his own right hand and set him far above every principality and power, and he was ascended on high and now made intercession for him. Had his teachers not assured him to say Jesus is Lord was a sign of the Holy Spirit's working Whereas no man in those days was considered to be a believer who could say, Jesus be cursed. Such thoughts must have invaded the mind of Antipas when he was forced with these decisions and he held fast. And because of his refusal to even offer a few simple grains of incense in a fire and mutter some meaningless words, Antipas was killed. And so went the death of many many, many Christians during the time of the Roman emperors. What we look at today is the question, what would we have done if we were in their shoes? We have to go back in time to put ourselves in this scenario to understand the depth of the deceitfulness and the trickery and the plot that the Pharisees and the Herodians laid before Jesus. What would I have done in Antipas' shoes? Boy, it would have been tempting to just say a few words, right? And ask forgiveness. I thank the Lord that I live in a country where I have freedom of religion. As flawed as it is, as broken as it is, it's the best thing going. 
I hope the day will never come that we'll be told to deny Jesus or be killed. Chances are it won't. But there are doubtless believers around the world facing that today. And as we stop and wonder this, we may find that our faith in Christ is about to cost us a friend, a job promotion. But if that happens, I hope we show the courage of Antipas. How should we respond to authority who behaves like this? You know, the world today gets, says, get on social media, call for a boycott, complain. Jesus knew that they were going to put him to death. And what did he say? Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. You know, the subtle lesson here is Jesus is teaching us all authority is established and overseen by God, by himself. You know, it doesn't mean if we disagree, we get to do what we want to do. But because God is sovereign over all, we must obey authority. And I want you to see the plot today, the ploy, and the precept. You know, the world will call to you, but you don't have to live a life of sin. You can live a life that brings God glory. And first of all, the plot, I want you to see the animosity. After hearing that Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, the Pharisees perceived that he was preaching about them. And, you know, uh, chapter 21 we studied, and, you know, just last week we studied this, that they knew that Jesus was preaching about them. Then the animosity is stirred. It, when they heard God's word, did they say, oh, thank you for preaching the truth. We are so grateful. We will repent. We will do works of righteousness. You know, nothing overjoys me to hear testimonies like we heard this morning during the mission update of how God worked in somebody's life. I mean, that gets me going, you know, because so many people reject. You know, I hope Sunday nights you'll come if for no other reason. I hope you come to learn about the Lord. I hope you come to worship the Lord. I hope you come to share what God's doing in your life. Nothing is a greater encouragement to those living and serving and ministering than to hear what God is doing in your life. That is a blessing. But from the triumphal entry to now, Jesus took on the religious leaders of the Jews. Did the, did the Jews say, thank you for confronting me with the truth? It's, I needed to hear this. They became angry. They were looking for ways to trip him up. Their plan was how can we make him lose power so, or you know, make him lose popularity so then we can cancel him. There's nothing new in cancel culture. He cleansed the temple of the commerce, the corruption of people taking shortcuts through it. We've studied that. He sparred with them over his authority in chapter 21, verses 23 through 27. And then when the chief priests and Pharisees heard these parables in chapter 21, verse 45, they knew that he was speaking about them, and they could not lay hands in verse 46. Therefore, let's cause trouble. You know, let's make his life miserable. Let's see if we can mess his life up. You know what my dad used to say? If you give somebody enough rope, they will hang themselves. I see a few of you have heard that phrase. That's a good one. Write it down. Every once in a while, I'll bust out these Midwestern phrases or, you know, old backwoods Pennsylvania phrases. Uncle Dave says, I got to write some of these down. I don't know what Uncle Dave says half the time either. It's cultural. We're learning from each other. My dad used to say, give somebody enough rope, they'll hang themselves. You know, people are their own worst enemy is the lesson there. And the Jews think, how can we get Jesus? How can we get to him? And you know, the, the, what's amusing here to me is they don't understand who they're dealing with. It, it is amusing to me to think that you think you can outsmart God. You know, their view of God is too small. They had the wrong view of Jesus. They were trying to make people lose respect or love for him, and they start planning, how can we bring him down? How can we make him vulnerable? Friends, I, that, that's just, that's laughable to think that you can outsmart God. And I hear this so often, oh, I'm going to tell God what's what when I stand before him. He's got a lot to answer for. That is not what my Bible says. 
My Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and we will stand silent. My Bible says Jesus has eyes like fire that can pierce to the very core and know everything. The Pharisees plotted how they might entangle him with his speech. Verse 15, the creator of the universe, the creator of communication. You ever met somebody that you are trying to argue with and they bust out, they finally say, you know, I'm the one who made this. You ever had that happen to you? My dad used to say, never talk like an expert, you might be talking to one. When, when we were doing this thing called Bible quizzing, we, we would try to find nuances in the rules that played to our advantage, like good competitors we were. My buddy was trying to, the captain of the team was trying to articulate something in his favor to give us an advantage. And finally, the, you know, he said, according to the rules, and the lady finally says, I wrote the rules. My buddy got smart and shut up and sat down. You know, these people are trying to trick Jesus with words. He invented them. He created them. He created the universe. He created communication. He created the tongue. He created the ability to communicate, and they think they can trick him. I mean, this is amusing. These religious leaders who are to promote him, to follow him, to obey him, they're the ones that ought to be leading others in worship of him. What were they leading others in in opposition to him? They had become about themselves. They had become all about what they wanted. They were educated beyond their own intelligence. You know, you ever met somebody who is promoted above their ability? Everyone's had a boss, amen? You know, have you, have you ever dealt with someone who, you know, much learning hath made him mad? You know, there's just something, there was just a bridge too far with them. They wanted to trap Jesus, and it reminds me of what C.S. Lewis said, defend the Bible, I'd sooner defend a lion. You know, friends, all we need to do is just turn God loose. All we need to do is to turn the Bible loose. The best way to do is just to preach and teach and quote the Bible. You know, that's it. And people are like, you know, why are you doing it that way? Because you can't argue with it. You can reject it, sure. You can hate it, sure. I've never fought with God in one. No one ever has. And we need to start thinking that way. This is God in human flesh. His brain is the only one that was ever not clouded by sin. He didn't need a cup of coffee in the morning. He didn't get tired. It's incredible when we, well, of course he slept, of course, but you know, he didn't get hangry is what I'm trying to say. You ever get hangry? Your spouse would never do nothing like that, right, right sweetheart? We need to understand these things. He is infinite. How many will say, I can't understand that, and that is too bad. But really, I'm glad my God is bigger than me. So many people say, well, you know, I want to make a little statue of a, of a man-like thing, or I want to make God to be like a human thing, or I, I, want to, I want God to be something I can understand. I can't understand it, so it can't be true. I am so glad that my God is infinite and, and while I'm finite. I am so glad there are things I will never understand because I need a God who's greater than me. I need a Savior who's perfect. I need something greater than myself. People will say, but I don't need that crutch. Oh, yes, you do. Friends, we need help. And since the triumphal entry, he has dealt with the chief priests and scribes. In chapter 21, verse 15, he dealt with the chief priests and elders. In chapter 21, verse 23, he dealt with the chief priests and Pharisees. In chapter 21, verse 45, and we're going to see the Pharisees lead the way and make an uncommon ally here, the Herodians. 
But in a speech made in 1863, Abraham Lincoln said this, We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray the God that made us. Boy, you don't hear that from the President of the United States anymore, do you? I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, I'd vote for that. But can I give you this thought, why do you use that illustration? Because I'm not talking about politics. Do you know that the Jews did the same thing? When you stop and ponder it. The Jews who had every blessing and every advantage and every rightful thing, they ought to have been willing, waiting, ready. I mean, they should have hit the ground running with Messiah, and they missed the boat by miles. I want to suggest to you that while they had a head start, we're catching up. And my lesson here is that God is patient, God is loving, and he's ready and waiting on us, but these people missed the boat. They were the ones who should have been ready, and they weren't. They vainly thought it was about them when it was all about him. If we're not careful, we'll make the same mistake. Second lesson today, the ploy. So, so they come up with this plan because the Jesus can't be in charge. We have to be in charge. So what's the plan? The ploy is they come to him with flattery. They set him up with flattering words. Can I give you a warning? If somebody is mean, you need to watch out when they're being nice. Okay? If you've seen somebody treat others meanly or they treated you meanly in the past, if somebody has spoken cruelly or if they have a mean streak in them, you need to watch out when they're being nice to you because something's coming you don't see, right? They come to him with a flattering setup. I mean, anybody would like this. They invite Jesus and the Herodians. Now, that's probably the Essenes. Now, I've studied this one with the time I had this week. And the Herodians are only mentioned a couple times in the Gospels, and most scholars say beyond what's said in the Gospels, we don't know. But Josephus gives us an insight, and I will spare you for sake of time that, that explanation. But if you study Josephus, I think the Herodians were probably the Essenes. You wonder, who are the Essenes? They're the Dead Sea Scroll guys, okay? They're the guys who wrote those. They loved Herod. They believed Herod was the king of the Jews. They believed Herod was the Messiah. Therefore, Jesus couldn't be Messiah because it messed with their Herod being Messiah, why they're called Herodians. They were essentially the cooperators with the government. They were the guys looking for the end of the world, right? They were the original preppers. That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls come from. And so I get all of these explanations from Josephus, and we just don't have time for all of this. But they hated Jesus. And that puts the Pharisees who are on the really religious legalistic side and the Herodians who are kind of normally on the other side, it puts those two together because the enemy of my enemy makes you my friend. Now, listen, you talk about a snake pit. And I got to thinking about that. That doesn't translate here because there are no snakes on the island. So how does that work? And so I I called up Auntie Karen. I said, Auntie Karen, what's a good local phrase for snake pit? She said, mongoose den. I thought to myself, that doesn't sound very deadly. I mean, it sounds nasty, but it doesn't sound deadly, right? And then I I was talking this out with a few other people. and, And you know what I finally came up with? Swimming with sharks while you're bleeding. Yeah, right? Yeah, that's just not a good plan. Oh, look, there's a bunch of tiger sharks. Let's jump in. Although, I have a plan for the boys who want to date my daughters. There we go. It was awful. You know, they came to him and they called him teacher. 
they had questioned his authority. They said, you are true. They really believed he was false. They didn't believe he was true. They didn't treat him like it. They challenged his teaching time and again. They even said, you don't care about anyone. Now, what's that mean? Let me explain the Greek here. The Greek here means literally a face looker. He didn't look at the crowd. You know, have you ever taught a lesson and realized you're losing people? A few of you are out there going, yeah, Pastor, I've had that experience. Right? You know what you do? Sometimes when you're teaching a lesson, the temptation is, well, I'm going to make it simpler. I'm going to make it nicer. I better reel in my horns here because it's not communicating. And I want them to like me before they pull out the tomatoes and the bricks. Jesus says, I don't care what their face looks like. I'm going to teach the truth. That's what they're saying. You don't care. You're going to preach the truth. Boy, that sounds good. Literally, this, literally, this means you don't change based on the audience. Jesus never wavered from the truth, even when it led to his death. All of these things sound good. Then spring the trap. They lay out a fiscal trap. And is it right to pay taxes? And your response is? Of course. Isn't it awesome when you get your tax return back? Hopefully you get money back. Now some of some I'll never forget the first time I got this one promotion and I had to pay and I was disappointed. Right? Normally you get a little something back, you know, go out to eat or something, but I'll never forget one time I got this promotion put me right in the next tax bracket but not enough to offset the taxes. That was disappointing. You know what, friends? Should you pay taxes? Yes. It's not an option. Why would this even be a question? By the way, do you know our own government understands that you're going to want to not pay taxes every chance you get? They even say it's okay to do that. It's called tax avoidance. If you look it up on the IRS website, it actually talks about tax avoidance, not paying what you don't have to pay. But tax evasion is a crime. That's not paying what you know you need to pay. That's the difference. Tax avoidance is not paying what you shouldn't have to pay. Tax evasion is not paying what you know you should pay. And what is that? That's called a crime. You go to jail for that. Stuff gets foreclosed and repossessed for that. And so we have to stop and ask ourselves, why is this even a question? And the Jews are making an argument here about the difference between a Mosaic law and Roman law. They're setting Jesus up because no matter which way he answers it, he's wrong. You see, the Jews were taught during the time all the way back from Abraham that they were to pay tithes and that they were to make offerings. And have you ever heard somebody say, well, you know, I, I just want to be, you know, what the Bible teaches us to do. Where do you find that in Scripture? You know, if you add up all the tithes and offerings you're supposed to do, it's well over 10%. It borders on something like 27% if you add it all up, you know, between the temple tax and the, the tax for when a, a male son is born. And then, you know, you have, you know, the, the Passover, the burnt offerings, the, the meat offering, the heave offering, the grain offering, the drink offering. I mean, when you add all of this stuff up, it really adds up, okay? And when you think about what the Romans were charging them, they were basically saying, we can't do both. That's essentially what, what the Pharisees are saying here. So with that in mind, what should we do? And what they're saying is that you either will be a compromiser spiritually because all of the people would rather have given tithes, the, the Jewish traditions, or you're going to become a, you know, um, a rebel against Rome and stirring up problems. And so we've got you trapped. And so this is the inverse of the world we live in today. See, in that day, they didn't want to pay taxes, but they wanted to pay tithes. In the world we live in today, everyone pays their taxes, but most people don't want to pay their tithes. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. And I don't know what anyone gives, so don't get excited. 
This is what Jesus preached here, okay? But I want you to get this. Jesus put taxes and tithes on equivalent levels. Think about that for a minute. He put them as equivalent here. Today, nobody skips their taxes unless they want to go to jail, but many will skip their tithing. And the Jews did not want to support the Roman regime. They wanted to bring their offerings to God, and the Romans made that hard. And the Romans were deeply resented, as was anyone who occupied Jerusalem before that and ever since. And the Pharisees and the Herodians come to Jesus, and they say, what should we do? The trap is set. If Jesus pays Caesar, the common people will go negatively. If he says, don't pay taxes, we've got him for rebellion. He's between a rock and a hard place. Have you ever heard about the irresistible force paradox? What happens when an immovable object is met by an irresistible or an unstoppable force? What will happen? You ever pondered that one? We did in philosophy class one time. My answer is they destroy each other. They cancel each other out. They go, where do you come to get that from? Science. Two equally opposing forces cancel each other out. The teacher did not want to hear that. Well, let's ask ourselves this question. Is, that a good, is a rock in a hard place a good explanation? Is the irresistible force uh, paradox a good you know, equation but I think the best explanation of the situation Jesus is in so that we can understand in our minds today, this is for all you sci-fi nerds out there, they set up a Kobayashi Maru. Okay? That's Star Trek. If you go, what is that, Pastor? I'll tell you. The Kobayashi Maru test is an impassable test. Basically, the, these guys in a spaceship have to go rescue people. If they don't rescue them, the people die. If they go in and rescue them, then an irresist and an unstoppable force kills them all and they die. Basically, they're testing the crew out to learn what defeat tastes like. Because when you face defeat for the first time, many people are paralyzed. And so they set up when their minds, the Kobayashi Maru, a test that's impassable. No one can get victory over this. No one has a chance of winning against this. And we find out that the one guy, the captain, I won't say his name, you all know it, that this one captain guy rigs the test. He changes, he cheats on the test so he can win. The only guy ever to win because he cheated. He changed the parameters. That's exactly what Jesus did here. You see, the Pharisees and the Herodians set up a test. They said, it's impossible. We can't win. And Jesus says, ah, we're going to change the parameters. The more you study this, you are amazed by the intelligence of our God, aren't you? I mean, I really want you to stop and ponder this and work with me here. I want you to see the precept. And letter A, the insight. Jesus in his omniscience sees this coming. It's not like, oh, they tricked him. He said to them, why tempt ye me, you hypocrites? They came to him with flattery. He saw right through it. Have you ever wanted people and friendships so badly that you'll do just about anything to get it? It's so tempting to compromise. You know, that's where our young kids are. That's where teenagers are. That's where young adults are. They're so hungry for friendships, they'll do anything for it. We have to teach them to love God like that. You know, and when you open up to somebody, they stab you in the back. You know, what happens when things like that happen? The walls go up. You never talk to people again. You don't trust them again. But what amazes me is Jesus' wisdom and knowledge. He sees the trap. He avoids the question. And it's one thing to see a trap. It's another thing to avoid it. And sometimes you shouldn't just engage but focus on the truth. And Jesus says, anybody got a quarter? You go, that's a penny. No, it's actually a day's wage. It's called a denarius. They're very small. It's a day's wage. It's smaller than a dime. I've actually held one. You can buy them on eBay. But a denarius is a small coin. And Jesus says to him, anybody got a quarter? Or, you know, anybody got a common coin? And he holds it up and he says, whose picture's on this thing? And they go, that's Caesar. It was Tiberius Caesar, by the way. And do you know that on the denarius... Of this time period, which was, by the way, he ruled from A.D. 14 to 37. He was the son of Augustus. 
um, it said Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus on one side, and on the other side, it said high priest. Do you realize that in Roman government, Caesar was not merely the head of the government, like we would think of maybe president, but he's, he was also the head of religion. He was God. He was worshipped like God as I went over. And to the Jews, what they were literally holding with Roman money was a graven image. To them, it was a violation of the second commandment that thou shalt have no graven images before me. And as we stop and consider this, Jesus asked for a coin which to the Jews would have been a violation of the second commandment. And how does he do this? You know, and I was deeply in thought over this when Al busted a joke in my ear. You know, I was thinking about this at, up at the youth retreat. I was deep in thought, pondering how this reconciled and what was Jesus doing here and trying to wrap my head around it. And Al busted a joke in my ear and I look at him and I just go, come on, man. And I told him later what was going on. He said, well, you needed a joke anyway. But, but, but many could not and many were put to death because early believers would not swear allegiance. And what we see here is that Jesus is saying, be good citizens, but we won't worship. That's what Jesus is saying. Use the money for what it's intended to spend on things. To Caesar, give what's rightfully his, not only the money as taxes, but also being a good citizen, but you're not going to worship him. This is not an idol. Just do the right thing. And that's why God was not upset here. Because he said it's an idol only if you make it one. And here's the instruction. The coin of Caesar was to go to Caesar's. No matter how they hated it, they had to give to him what they were supposed to give. They had to pay taxes to a human authority. But who ordained that authority? God did. And you know what? You may not agree with who's in authority now, previously, or in the future, but you need to pray for him. I'm corny enough to believe God can still bring revival. My God is still in control the day before and the day after elections. Amen? And we need to pray and intercede, right? And no matter how they hated him, they had to give to him. And at the same time, tithes are elevated in our minds to the same level as taxes. Now, there are actually churches that report to the pastor who's tithing and how much. And some churches actually discipline people for not tithing enough. I'm serious. It exists. There's even stories of old, early church where they would pass the basket on a board, and if you didn't put enough in, they would put it in front of the guy and shake it. You've heard of that one. I'm talking, there, there's the other one, too. It exists. And you go, this stuff is crazy. Because God knows. Listen, I, I want to be clear. I don't know what anyone gives. I never will know. But I do think it's a termination offense if a staff member doesn't make pay tithes. Flat out, I, I would fire an assistant pastor over that without a second hesitation. It's a bad example. But as we stop and think about this, we don't know who gives. It's up to you and God. But Jesus, God himself, puts tithes and taxes on the same level. And if anything, we are told to obey God rather than men. You know, I was just talking in Sunday school. Somebody said, you know, somebody told my girls, well, you know, we don't want to be arrogant. Well, it's better than being ignorant, right, about the Word of God. There are other people out there, well, we don't want to offend anybody. Well, we definitely don't want to offend God. And here's my point. Anybody skip their taxes? Anybody... You know, I got a little thing in the mail told me my registration fees were up for my vehicle. Isn't that the best piece of mail ever? I just went, is it already? Oh, that's the first story. Oh, really? Already? I just paid that a year ago. But you know what I said? Ah, burn it. 
No. What I say to my wife? I got to go take care of that this week. Anybody not filed their, their boat fees, the sales tax, real estate taxes? Boy, you don't feel you don't want to miss your real estate taxes, do you? There's probably more that I'm missing, but here's my point. What if we paid our tithes like we pay taxes? What if we paid taxes like we pay our tithes? I mean, what kind of shape would we be in? And, and so many times, and I know, I worked with people that said, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to do that. I can't afford to do that. I mean, I'm not paying 10% on anything. You know, I worked with an unsaved guy that said that. My answer is you don't want to rob God. And when we stop and consider all of this, Jesus comes back at them and says, just do the right thing. How did they respond to his teaching? I mean, they set up a Kobayashi Maru. They set up an impassable test. And what did they do? Look here at verse 22. When they heard these things, they, what's it say? They marveled. They were amazed. They were speechless. It blew their minds, the Don Gray translation. And left him. And went their way. Can there be any sadder response to God's word ever? They, they hear it. They see it. They're astonished and instructed by it but they go away back to sin. You know, friends, I want to tell you something. It's not enough to come hear a good sermon. Although, let me know when there is one, because it's probably not by me. It's not enough to hear God's word. We have to be changed. These folks heard and were amazed. They went back to their old sinful life and they left God alone. I can't think of a sadder thing that was done than in this moment because they didn't change to become like Jesus. I'm grateful for those who taught me the importance of tithing years ago. I will never forget as a college student going to a church and they taught me the importance of tithing, 10%. You know, college students don't make a lot of money. Sometimes they can, but I did not. I remember making less than the minimum wage at my campus, and I thought, how is this legal? You know, you'd work all these hours for that paycheck and go, oh, dear. Students don't have a lot, and 10% is not a whole lot. And when you factor in, you know, they even, they, 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 they just, you know, told me straight, Don, you're not going to be here forever. You're only going to be here three years, eight years tops, and after that you're going to move on, we hope, or else you're going to be a lifer, and that's, you know, maybe that's different. But that's not much help. They said, we're training you to go out. Yet they taught us the biblical principles of tithing from Abraham, who gave tithes to Melchizedek, the tithe in Leviticus, and Malachi. It was reaffirmed by Jesus right here. And what they taught is easy when you make little. But there's an old story about a millionaire having a hard time giving, and he goes to his pastor, and the story is by W.A. Criswell. He tells of an ambitious young man who told his pastor he promised God that he would tithe on his income. And they prayed that God would bless his career. And at the time, he was making $40 a week. And so he tithes $4 out of the $40 he made a week. And God blessed him. And soon, his income increased, and he was tithing $500 a week. You can do the math. He was doing okay for himself. He called the pastor up, and he says, Pastor, can I be released of the obligation of the tithing commitment I made? It's expensive now. Think about that. The pastor replied, I don't see how you can be released from your promise, but what I can do is I will ask God to reduce your income back to $40 a week when you had no problem tithing $4. Amen.
You know, I want to I challenge us with this thought that when you love God, it's all an act of worship, and it's easy to give to that which you love. And when you branch out in faith and trust and just do right, I don't know how it works. I, mathematically, it doesn't work, but all I can tell you is I have never had more than when I've given God first. And I've never had less than when I made all the money in the world and I didn't give him any. It just doesn't work. But can I challenge you with this thought? When you put God first, not only does it work better for you, but there is joy in serving your Savior. And it applies in tithing, but it says here, give to God the things that are God's. Not just money. Prayers church, worship, honor, glory, preeminence. Obviously, money is the point here. I think Jesus and his wisdom had much more in mind. You know, friends, we need to remember that God needs to be first. Don't rob God. The Bible says, you know, you know um, would a man rob God? And you say to yourself, have you ever been afraid that somebody's going to rob your house? I'll never forget some people, right? Everybody has. I know some people that have come to church or been away on vacation at Christmas time. They come back and they say, our house got robbed before Christmas. It's happened to people in this church. And people were salty about that. And I don't blame them. But I want to ask you a question if you knew where that person lived, would you go get your stuff back? You go, of course. When we rob God, he knows where you live. He knows when you did it, how you did it. He knows where you sleep. He knows everything. Listen, I'm not after money today because ultimately it's God's. I have like zero control of the money in this church, by the way. You know what happens? You and God are in for trouble. You need to put God first in everything. That's my goal, is that we as a church love God and do right with everything we're told to do. This is not something I preach often, but Jesus did here, and so I am. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, I'm going to challenge you with some spiritual things here. Has it occurred to you that all authority is set up by God? We need to teach our children and our families that God is in control. Have your children ever had teachers or friends they don't like? All authority is by God. God is still in control, everybody. Man may hate God's authority. I'm telling you this. When you stand for God's word, they're not going to be like, oh, thank you, this is just what we needed to hear, although it is. They're probably going to get to work hating on you for real. It's amusing to think that man can outwit God, isn't it? I, I mean, when you stop and think about it, it's really amusing to think that these people who are to be spiritual leaders thought that they could outwit the God that they were serving. It's borderline sad. Can I warn you, beware when evil people use kind words? Oh, but they just think I'm better. Who would want friends like that? Watch out for flattering words. Watch out for people of inconsistent behavior. God tells us to be good citizens to pay our taxes. No two ways about it. God equates taxes and tithes as mandatory. Boy, that does not work well in the world we live in today, does it? Oh, I just want it to be genuine. I just want it to be organic. I just want it to be free-flowing. God says we have to do the right thing. And I know many of you do, and I thank you. And, but I want to tell you the saddest response can be to hear God's word, to be amazed by it, to leave him, and go back to sin. So today in our closing song, the altar is always open in this church. I'm not a big bomb the aisles kind of guy. You know, honestly, I'm not a big invitation guy. You want to know why? Because we're commanded to repent, not invited to. 
And I want to challenge you. You don't need to do it here. You don't need to do it with me. You can do it in your seat. You can do it at the altar. But I want to challenge you right now to respond to God if he's working in your heart. So with that, let's close in prayer and we'll close in song. Lord, as we bow before you today, we ask for your honor and glory. Lord, we ask that you in all things be lifted up. Forgive us, Lord, how easily the things and cares of this life creep in and we put things in your place. Lord, we have never been without. You have always provided everything we need. And I thank you for that provision in my own life and in my family's life. I thank you even for the hand of correction in my life. And Lord, I pray that as a church that we will have victory that's found only in obedience to you. We ask for your honor and glory in all things because your son's blood is precious and it is our calling as your children. And based on that, we pray boldly and ask for victory. Thanks, Pastor Don, and uh, we're going to sing the final hymn today, number 458. 458, Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul, and now I belong to him. And is it true, do, do you belong to him? And uh, yes, it's important to belong to him. Let's uh, stand and sing this. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Once I was lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Joy floods my soul, for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he gave to redeem. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Father, thank you for the message today from your word, and, and uh, we thank and praise you for your wisdom, Lord, and we saw how you took care of those through the Lord Jesus who wanted to trap him, Lord, and um, help us have the right words to say, too, as we trust in you and we follow you, and that uh, we might bring glory to your name, and Father, may we live our lives uh, according to... Um, to wanting to please you and to serve you, Lord, and the desire to put you first, Father, in all things, uh, whether it is money or it's our time or talents, whatever it might be, Father, that we, we use everything for your glory, that we might help others to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, yes, if you are helping in VBS, my wife needs to see you. So please see my wife this morning if you're helping in VBS, okay? God bless you. Have a wonderful night.